All right, hello everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Beer and Bastards, the best show ever. It's clearly the best show ever when Kevin's not here. So tonight we're probably like the second best show ever. Um, I want to welcome everybody, Michael Lee from Being Liberal Logic. Um, we have a, 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 a guy from uh, Unbiased America here. His name is Kevin Ryan. Some of you, most of you probably don't know who he is, and that's probably a good thing. Um, and we have a new co-host tonight, uh, Grant Phillips. He writes with the Libertarian Republic, and he's an admin at We Are Capitalists. I also want to give a shout out to uh, Jason Hubbard at We Are Capitalists for making a really great, what are those things called again? The um, graphics, very good graphics. They're, they're, they're second to none, except for myself, because mine are better. And um, uh, so a shout out to them. And me, uh, co-host Will Riccadella with the Analytical Conservative. And I wanted to start the show off tonight with the big news about Ted Cruz, who's been called everything like like a neocon. And what are the other names they call neocon? Um, uh, I don't know. Corporate show. Yeah. What do you what do you guys think of uh, of, of Ted Cruz? And uh, you know, I don't want to juxtapose him just yet against Rand Paul. But Mike, I'll start with you, and I'll end with Grant. I'll go in the the order it is on the screen here. What do you think of Ted Cruz? Do you think he adheres to, say, classical liberal principles? Um, do you think, you know, do you think libertarians just are ad ad averse to Ted Cruz because of his his moniker as a conservative? What do you think? I think that uh, when you look at the landscape of politicians in Washington, it's hard to find someone. I mean, there are people, obviously, but it's hard to find many that uh, libertarians would be able to empathize with more than Ted Cruz. I don't agree with everything Ted Cruz has to say, but I mean, uh, do I like him? Yeah, I like him. Uh, I'm not. I'm not gonna. Neocon. I, I can't find too many faults with him. So you're a neocon, in other words. Yeah, I'm, I'm a total neocon status. All right. What do you think, Kevin? You you are terrible at that. <laughs> what are you it's talking very, about? Nobody can read what you're writing. It's written yeah, so Yeah, it's our small. graphics. Mike is a neocon. Oh, God. I don't know. Ted Cruz is... it is, too small? Yeah, it is. It looks and huge to me. Harder. What was the one before that? Mike abuses a cat? What's wrong with you? What are you, sniffing glue? <laughs> no, before the show, his cat was crawling over his computer, and he was, he was swiping it away. And I said, that's tantamount to abuse. We had to call PETA. Yeah. Yeah, it was called animal control. It's very abusive. All right, now go ahead and give us your thoughts on Ted Cruz, Kevin. All right. I when know I you're going to love him. Cruz. Yeah. When I, I think about love, Ted I know because you know McCain's not out there again. You're all upset about it. So go ahead McCain. and tell us how much you hate Ted Cruz because he's anti. Well, let me tell you about Ted Cruz. You shared this on Unbiased America um, yesterday, I think. It was a graphic from Wall Street Journal. How conservative are GOP presidential candidates? And I mean, it's listing a good 30, 40 people here, you know, potential candidates. Cruz is listed as the most conservative. Both, um, well, they combine, it looks like they're combining his, his public statements with his voting record, and they come up with an average. And of all the people on the list, starting with Chris Christie being the least conservative, um, Ted Cruz is the most conservative. And they even have some historical candidates sprinkled in here. Barry Goldwater is less conservative than Ted Cruz, according to this metric. Now, how's that going to play with the mainstream? I, I, I've heard a lot of talk about whether or not the mainstream is actually going to rally behind this guy or whether or not he's actually pissed them off. Enough. You know, um, he said some things that some people don't agree with. A lot of people don't agree with. So when you're that far out to the right, are you going to be able to get through the primaries? Or is it going to help you in the primaries? I don't know. Uh, it helped with Obama being that far on the left. Do you think he's that far on the right? I mean, based on what he's been saying? Will, can you hear me? That's a him. very interesting insight, Kevin. You have I no idea. You. You yeah, I heard you said me. Ted Cruz. Wall Street Journal said that Ted Cruz is the most conservative candidate. Am I... No, don't worry. Don't worry about what I know. All right, pal. Yes. Um, uh, I think that's a good assessment. I want to move along to Grant. Grant, can you kind of characterize what Kevin just said? Because I didn't hear a word he did say. 
and then give well, your own. Well, it was pretty much it was pretty much all incoherent rambling, from what I could tell. Uh, <laughs> I was pouring a beer, so I, I don't know. Uh, but I I think Ted Cruz. I mean, he's anti he's pro drug war. Uh, he's anti gay marriage. He's kind of a moralist, you know. Which I mean, that's what you're gonna get out of the right, anyways. Uh, but as far as net reductions in government size go, I think that that will be as in game um, as a politician currently and potentially as president or wherever else he ends up. Uh, and I think net reductions in the size of government right now is the most important thing. Um, and he's, uh, I think he's talked a lot about, um, he's talked a lot about uh, opting out of social security, which I think is a great idea. I would love to get out of that shit. Okay, that's pretty good. I don't know. I mean, I think Kevin, because he is a neocon statist, bootlicking sycophant for the GOP establishment, likes Ted Cruz. So I'm going to go with that. Um, now I want to kind of put them together. I want to, I want to, uh, you know, juxtapose them with Rand Paul and Ted Cruz. They're similar in a lot of ways. Both oppose gay marriage. I mean, you, I think Grant, you characterize it as a moralist. I think a Ted Cruz, uh, Rand Paul takes that position. They also have the same position on ISIS. Um, uh, in so far as foreign policy is concerned, I know Ted Cruz is against uh, nation building, as is Rand Paul. I think they both have a more prudent foreign policy strategy, which is to just, uh, uh, you know, whatever is in the best interest of the United States of America, and I don't think policing the world is. Um, I think they're both against the police state that's, uh, that's ever evolving at the federal level. Um, what do you think, Mike? I think there's more similarities, far more similarities, and there are differences insofar as they both really adhere to the rule of law. Um, that's what they're most concerned about. I don't really take issue with their moral stances because there's not much that they can do from the federal level. What do you think? I think, uh, well, yeah, if you're, if you're asking, you know, are there more similarities than there are differences? Oh, for sure. There's a lot more similarities than there are differences. And the differences, for the most part, are pretty minor. I don't think that, uh, you know, I, th I, I think that most people, at least from a libertarian bent, would probably prefer Rand Paul. And I think there are people out there that also doubt uh, Ted Cruz's sincerity. My concern is actually that because they're so similar and because they'll probably be going after a lot of the same voters in the primary, that they might end up splitting votes and uh, letting someone like Jeb Bush, who takes the core of the Republican Party, uh, you know, start winning states because... People, people, Tea Partiers and Libertarians may be splitting between Ted Cruz and Rand Paul a little bit. Uh, that would be my main concern because they're so similar. So that that's the main issue I have with Ted Cruz deciding to run is because I think everybody knew beforehand it was kind of Rand Paul's uh, time to shine. And uh, Ted Cruz actually came in, was supposed to be kind of a supporter of Rand Paul, and now he might take votes from him. So that's that's what concerns me. That's a legitimate concern. I mean, I could see that. I hope I like to see the competition. I want to see what they both say. And I mean, I don't, you know, I, I just want to get the base to be galvanized. And I think if Rand Paul and Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz ran, it would really excite the base. Um, Kevin, what, what do you think? What do you, do you think there's more similarities? Do you think there's more differences? Do you think a lot of it is just an ideological love fest for one over the other? No, I think both of them started their careers as uh, the Tea Party favorites. So, you know, a lot of the people in the Tea Party are going to be stirred up by their candidacies. I think it's interesting that both of them are trying to co-opt certain uh, voting bases that you wouldn't think that they would be going for. Um, when he announced his candidacy, Cruz talked about God a lot. He was talking about, um, what did he say? that rights don't come from man, they come from God Almighty, he said. And he talked about how the United States is a shining city on the hill. He's really pressing for the evangelical vote. He's trying really hard to do something that I think is gonna be difficult for him to do, because I don't think, he, they, I don't think religious people believe him, to be honest. Um, I'm not sure he's gonna get that vote. As for what Rand Paul's doing, he's doing another similar tact, only for, with him it's about um, gay marriage. If you'll notice, he's taking the position, which is going to keep his base intact, that marriage has no place in government. He's saying that um, that government should stay out of marriage, defining what marriage is. But at the same time, um, he's also trying to trying for the conservative base by saying that he dis he disagrees with gay marriage and he doesn't believe in it personally. 
Um, so he's trying to he's trying to play the middle, and I think both of them are, in some respects, are trying to court um, voters that uh, they're going to have a hard time getting. And I think both of them are heavy underdogs when it comes to getting through the uh, getting through their um, primaries. But Will has disappeared. Yeah, well, yeah he has. Uh, but I, I think you made a good I'll point, Kevin. I think. Uh, on the Cruz Paul comparison, hey. one thing I think that Rand Paul is doing exceptionally more than Ted Cruz is minority outreach. Uh, he's really spread the idea of a more inclusive GOP, probably more than ever. Um, speaking to, like in Berkeley, he got a standing ovation. I don't think Ted Cruz could walk into Berkeley and get a standing ovation. Uh, he's been to Chicago and, and done that thing and, and a couple other places on the East Coast that are typically um, minority liberal uh, groups and done very well, they're very well received. But to Mike's point, yeah, it's going to be a split vote in the primaries and the, the minority outreach is not going to matter in the primaries because um, they're all registered Democrats anyways. But uh, the, the one big difference I see is, again, uh, I know I said this before, is the moralist thing. Rand Paul is on the other end of the spectrum as far as that goes. Uh, he's anti-drug war. He's got that uh, act on or that bill going on with Cory Brooker. Uh, and Ted Cruz, of course, wants to enforce federal law on all the uh, legal marijuana states while also claiming that states should decide gay marriage. So it's kind of this weird back and forth between the role of federal government and the role of state government. And uh, I think that could come back to Biden, but it, I don't know if it would be in the primaries. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I agree. And uh, to Kevin's point, too, I think that it's interesting that Cruz is trying to go after the religious right. Uh, you, you, that's kind of Santorum's area. But when you look, I think Cruz has more appeal to uh, general election voters than Santorum would have. So it's interesting that I, I feel like maybe he's trying to steal some of those people away, hoping that that if he can get them and some of the Tea Party people, he'll still be well positioned for the general. I think that's his strategy. Well, both of them have big holes in their bases. I mean, both of them are going to mm -hmm. have a tough time competing for the average uh, conservative voter. And um, both of them are trying to fill those holes. And I'm not sure. I think Ted might be a little more successful going after the religious right. Um, I'm not sure Rand is going to be all that successful, but don't count out the fact that there's a lot of people that want Rand. They like the, his last name. They like his dad. There, there are a lot. He, he brings a lot of enthusiasm to the table and this. He's got this whole narrative surrounding him that the media is playing into that. He's the interesting candidate. He's the one that, you know, the standout guy, he's not like the rest, you know, he's not like the rest of these people. And interestingly, also, if you look at his numbers, if he should get through the primaries, which I frankly don't think he has a chance in hell, um, simply because, um, you know, he comes from a different background and, and has a lot of different, um, <laughs> he's not, I don't think he's going to be able to get through the, Will, shut the fuck up. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but if you look at his numbers, if he does make it to the to the general election versus uh, Hillary, he is the one who competes the best head to head versus Hillary. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that some on the left are more appeal to he appeals to some on the left more than he does to his own his own conservative uh, voters. So we'll see if he makes it there, which I don't think he will. I think it might be time for uh, some of the diehard libertarians to kind of swallow their pride and realize that we're in a time where we need major reductions in the size of government. And the only way to do that is to get out and actually vote for someone who's willing to do that, like Rand Paul or Ted Cruz, as opposed to, you know, sitting by and saying, oh, I don't want to vote because of whatever reason and letting like Jeb Bush win the primary or Hillary or, you know, and then it'd be like a Hillary Clinton versus Jeb Bush or some shit like that. And I'm moving to Pacific Islands. That happens. Fuck that. I'm out. <laughs> um, Mike, I want to bring this up. I mean, I, Ted Cruz has been on the forefront of a lot of issues. He was first to want to repeal Obamacare and speak vociferously about it. He was stood outside. Uh, um, uh, I can't remember. It was a Capitol Hill. I don't remember where he stood outside of, but he was. He called for the abolition of the IRS. Um, the guy's serious, and he doesn't really care what people say. McCain called him and Rand Paul cuckoo birds at one time. He doesn't care what Lindsey Graham and that nasally crappy southern voice say. I can't stand that guy. 
and he doesn't really toe the line with McConnell and his sure 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 sure. Uh, he's like in there for change, and and people are like, oh, compromise this, compromise that. Well, we don't compromise our founding principles. I said it off air. The Constitution is not up for a vote. The problem with a lot of these politicians, the establishment of both parties, is they move so far away from constitutional principles and those of classical liberalism that we've gotten into this. We're in this post-constitutional period where it's outright lawlessness. You have the legislature delegating powers to the executive branch. They were never intended to have. You have the judiciary being the, 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 the final arbiters on decisions they were never intended to, to grant. Um, and then you have the executive circumventing Congress. This is insane. At, at what point do we say, look, we got to put a stopgap. We got to stop being so ideologically, uh, I don't know, pure and, and, and stop bashing these guys and rather help them. I mean, I'd help Rand Paul, help, help Tip. I'd like them both the same. I, I, I'd love to see one of them you know, lead the pack, but at some point we've got to support both of them and, and, and to know that this is just the beginning of the fight. It's really not the end. So, and I mean, our fight's not within the libertarian conservative community. It's within the, it's in more within the classical liberal community. I could put them under a broad tent and this, and the, the Fabian socialists and the Marxists, you know what I mean? These people that want these redistributive uh, policies that come at the, that, that come at the expense of our property rights and our, our natural rights. What do you think, Mike? I don't know what you're really asking me. You kind of went on a rant, so I mean, I agree with most of what you're yeah, saying. I agree with most of what you're saying. You know, if that's what you want, you want you want some confirmation of what you were talking about. Cause... No, no, no. What do you think? What do you think about the libertarian conservative conservative dichotomy? Do you think it's constructive? Do you think it's destructive? At what point do we get rid of this "how pure are you" nonsense or this libertarian purity test? And then just and move on and try to you know try one step at a time. Try to uh, how many you know, libertarians are there? The scope of government. How many libertarians are there? Well, is, is it really a big? But I want them to vote. Yeah, well, so do I. But not. Pro you're probably that's a good point. What do you think, Grant? You well, want to say Gary that? Johnson's running for president again, and everyone's all, well, all the libertarian, you know, pages are all blowing up. Like, oh, everybody, go out and vote for Gary Johnson. So what? He can win one person of the vote, and then Hillary Clinton can be president. Great. <laughs> Back to square one. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, and it's not just libertarians that have the purity test. You see a lot of uh, people, they want conservatives to be, you know, religious conservatives. That's on the primary. They say that they're always talking about analysts are always saying, well, some people run too far to the right. And then when they get into the general election, they can't win. But then again, you, you, you know, the last two primaries, they've taken McCain, they've taken Romney, the people that they thought could run down the middle and win the general. And that didn't work either. So it's it's interesting. I, I think I, but I think I think you'll I'll, I'll, I think you'll see the same dynamic in the Democratic Party. I think a lot of people that are way to the left in the liberal purity test are going to be challenging Hillary Clinton because Hillary Clinton voted for Iraq War. Hillary Clinton doesn't have you know shining liberal credentials, and you got Elizabeth Warren coming up who's a liberal hero. Obviously, I hate Elizabeth Warren, but liberals are going to if there's a pure liberal test and. You know, Hillary's going to be forced to the left of Warren on some issues, and that should be interesting, too. So it's not just libertarians. Right. The good news for us is at least libertarians are so small that Rand and Cruz can at least try to win over the Republican base with our support. And then that and then hopefully after that, you know, then we can work on a general. So at least at least at least we have a small base to work with to get on board. Those are good points. Um you know, the aspects of Ted Cruz, I was listening to a speech of his the other day, and he mentioned the founding fathers and so on and so forth, the natural rights and where our rights come from. And then I, a couple of the pundits, and this is on the Fox News station, are saying, man, this guy is way far right. And, uh, you know, he's probably too far right for the rest of the field. And that, if that case, every, all the founding presidents up until James Monroe are all too far right. Uh, James Madison's too far right, Jefferson's, these guys are all too far, what does that mean? Our Constitution's too far right in that case, Rand Paul's too far right, he espouses the Constitution. So our founding principles are far too, are too far right for a lot of these people, I don't understand it. A common core, that's nonsense, that, that was never intended by the founders and framers, that has nothing to do with liberty, that's ridiculous, that's a power grab. A lot of these things from the federal government are power grabs, and, and a lot of rep establishment Republicans and Democrats facilitate it. What do you think, Kevin? You're kind of an establishment bootlicking GOP's big government statist. Do you agree with do you do you agree with me? Do you think a lot of this do you think that Rand Paul and Ted Cruz type stand on the outside? 
and, and, and are kind of trying to fight their way in. I think they represent a lot of the libertarian values right, and a lot up, of the conservative up, values. And we don't have a voice. Will you, and, Jesus and they, Christ. Get the pepper yeah, grinder yeah. going. You can't <laughs> shut this guy up. Listen, here's the thing. Number one, you're buying into a, a left a media narrative. You're buying into a left media narrative, which is that there's such a thing as too far right. I mean, is there socially uh, too far to the right? Well, you, that, then you have to argue what is the social right, and you know that's a different ball game. But is there really such a thing as too far to the right when it comes to some of the liberty, uh, you know, the liberties and, and so forth? I don't think so. I mean, we were supposed to have. Um, you know, we were supposed to have a constitution that protected us, and now some of the very things in the constitution are being called too far to the right, which is an odd notion, right. considering that's what we're supposed to be following. So, but the other thing I want to bring up is that the bigger problem I think for Republicans is there's a lot more variety, variation in the in the on the right than there is on the left. I think on the left you've got exactly. the far left, and, you, and you've got the left. On the right, I think the right has co-opted in a certain way um, libertarians. I don't think there's as many left libertarians. In fact, I've never been quite sure what the hell that even means. Um, but I think the right <laughs> has a lot more variety. You've got religion. You've got uh, the, the, the New England conservative, which are totally different ball games than conservatives anywhere else. You've just got a lot more variety on the right. And so it's, it's, it's tougher to, to keep everybody happy and things tend to split apart. And that's why when you have a, few, a large amount of uh, different potential candidates, You've got a lot of people rooting for a lot of different um, people, and you're going to split apart the uh, the vote. And so I think they're always going to have a tougher time bringing together the the vote um, on the conservative side than you are for for um, liberals. That's a good that's a way to say it. What do you, Grant? I mean, and and to to Kevin's point, do you think that um there uh, that like the media and m most definitely the left and establishment Republicans are kind of moving the spectrum, the political spectrum, saying that, you know, the Constitution here, man, that's really far right. And, you know, this living Constitution and progressivism, that's real. That's really political pragmatism. What would you say to that? Well, I think a lot of those things have been sort of reinterpreted with various labels that don't really mean anything. They are just pretend to mean something. So you hear this word progressive. Well, what, progressive to what? Like to socialism? Uh, that's not very progressive. <laughs> Uh, and then at the same point, you know, uh, uh, what Kevin said on the left hand, on the left of the political spectrum, you have moderates and then you have far leftist socialists. And, and I think what happened in 2012 and well, 2008 really uh, was a lot of the moderates went to Obama because they were tired of what they perceived was the sort of the far right of the Bush years, which it realistically wasn't far right at all. It was, again, kind of moderate pandering to uh, the, the neocon establishments like Kevin, and then also at the same time, um, that sort of switched to the moderate progressive left. So they kind of played really both sides of the ball game, and it ended up being the same thing, an establishment. So there is no, as far as the establishment goes, there is no left or right, it's just the establishment, and they just kind of play it off with whatever label was trending at the time. That makes that's clear enough. That's a good point, Mike. What do you think? Do you think people like the, the establishment and these big government types are looking to looking to shift the political spectrum? I'm sorry, you you broke up a little at the end of your question. What what was that? Do you think do you think that like uh, big government politicians specifically and those in the media are looking to shift the political spectrum more in their favor, meaning that progressivism has become like political pragmatism? Whereas constitutional republicanism was political pragmatism at the founding. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. You see, you see this all the time when they when they talk about Washington not getting anything done and Washington needs to compromise and all this stuff. Well, here's the thing: compromise is great as long as it's in with within the framework of the law. But a lot of the times, what they want to compromise on is actually illegal. And Congress takes an oath to the Constitution. That's the law they have to follow. So if if the compromise you want to make is outside of the limits of what Congress's power is, well, I don't care how much they're not willing to compromise. They're not allowed to compromise. They're not allowed to compromise constitutional principles. But the media has painted this picture where, oh, well, you know, if you're not a, if you don't want more government, well, you're just not willing to compromise. And you're so they're, they, yeah, they're they're definitely pushing uh, the spectrum towards more big government, right. and they're trying they're pushing away. They're minimizing what the actual role of government is supposed to be. 
in the debate and just saying, hey, if, if you don't compromise, well, you're, you're just not getting anything done. You're not doing anything for anybody. Right. That's a good point. Um, back to the Cruz and Rand Paul thing. I have an interesting question. I want to give it to Kevin first so he could butcher it and then you guys can clear it up. Um, do you think that what like how did how would you specifically how could you specifically see Rand Paul and Ted Cruz governing differently from the executive position? What do you think would stand out the most you know what would stand out starkly between the two if they were governing? Between the two or the two of them versus everybody else? I think if you looked at those oh, the, two no, versus between the two anybody between, else yeah. Between the two? I don't no, know. No, between the two. I, yeah, right? I, I, I don't know. I don't know how they would be different. I do know, and I said this, it was last week or two weeks ago, that I think there's going to be, if, if Rand Paul especially ends up becoming somehow a miraculous victor to the presidency in 2016, I think there's going to be a lot of disappointed people. And it's not because he's not going to try. I just don't think there's a whole lot that you can do if you don't have the party apparatus or if you don't have um, the legislature underneath you agreeing to put through legislation that you want. Um, it's just going to be very difficult for him to for him to do to really get any of his vision done. And I think you see that a lot in his voting record where his his talk is a lot different than his voting record. What he talks about in his voting record are two different things. Somebody else raised this last time. Does he have the chance to vote on what he wants to vote on? It, it might be that he can talk the talk, but the legislation that gets put up there is just not what he wants to vote on. So his his voting record and and his and his talking points are very different. The, they're the most divergent of any candidate for the for the Republican uh, nominee. And so I think if he gets somehow becomes president, I don't think there's a whole lot he's going to be able to accomplish unless the public gets behind his agenda and starts pressuring politicians to follow him. And I'm not sure I see that happening either. He's really got to, he's really got to stir, stir things up. He's really got to get a lot of, uh, a lot of um, energy behind him if he's going to make a difference. <laughs> That's, I'm sorry, I'm not, this, you know, Mike keeps screwing around, so it's clearly all Mike's fault. Anyway, that's a good that's a good assessment, Grant. My original question, you and you probably like this question a little bit more. How could you see Rand Paul governing differently than Ted Cruz, if at all? Well, I think Ted Cruz has shown that he has a little bit uh, more aggression as far as it goes with uh, getting things done on his own in a way. Um, you know, he stood and made a green eggs and ham speech for how, like hours on end about Obamacare. Um, probably well knowing that it wasn't going to actually do anything, but he just did it anyways. Uh, so I could see him being, and as oxymoron as this sounds, being pro-liberty via executive order. Um, I, I just see him the person doing that, and I don't necessarily agree with that approach, but uh, I could see him doing that. Whereas Rand thus far has shown to be the one to reach across the aisle, and uh, I think he would be more prone to do that. And I think he's building the support to do just that. Now, whether he, his minority outreach is successful in getting him elected, let's say he gets elected partially because of his minority outreach, how that translates into getting stuff done after he wins the presidency, I'm not really sure uh, because I would assume that most of the people would remain registered Democrats. So I don't, I don't know. I, I really couldn't speak to how that would actually affect the legislative outcome. But I would think it would be for the positive, just because uh, that's how our democracy works or whatever you want to call it. That's a good point. Mike, I want to bring that to you. Do you think Ted, Ted Cruz's uncompromising position, this, uh, this kind of Lone Ranger attitude, do you think that would hurt him as an executive or do you think that would help him? Well, as an executive in today's climate, it would probably hurt him. Just just today's Washington. You look the the media will pull, will will look at it and they'll say, look, Ted Cruz isn't willing to work with Congress. He doesn't. He just wants to do his own thing. He doesn't care about you. He just cares about himself. Yada yada. That's how it's that how that's how it will get painted. You know, with Ted Cruz's attitude. Okay. Um, there's a lot of people talking about Ben Carson. I mean, I don't know much about. I like Ben Carson. I think he's a brilliant guy. I, don't, I, I just think that be coming in as an untrained politician, that's a really good thing. I think that's excellent. He's coming from the outside. The problem is he can't handle a lot of the media scrutiny. Um, uh, you know, the questions are only going to get tougher. 
I don't know how he'll, how he'll answer them or how he'll respond to that. Um, what do you guys think? Uh, Kevin, what do you think of Ben Carson? Uh, do you think he's just, the only reason he has legitimacy now is as an outsider? And if he's not an outsider anymore, do you think he loses his luster? Go ahead. No, he's definitely an outsider, and he comes from the Tea Party movement too, but he he has some more legitimacy when it comes to trying to capture the uh, the religious right. I mean, he he talks very biblically all the time. He's always talking about passages from from the Bible. And you'll remember when he started out, where he came to to the forefront was at I believe it was a Bible breakfast or something. Uh, then he where he was criticizing President Obama, and people took notice and people said this guy's willing to stick up to Obama. And I don't think a lot of people at the time realized how far, you know, his religious views are, but I think that's going to scare some people, you know, in this day, it scares people if you're too religious. So um, when he comes, when it gets to the general election, I think he's going to turn off a lot on the left. Uh, maybe not, I could be wrong, but I think his religious, the religious power that he brings to the, to the, to his position might scare a lot of people away. But then again, I'm in New England Do you where think it it's a liability if you're religious. <laughs> Do you think the criticisms are valid or is it just racism from the left and the right? Or is everybody just racist? Because that's, I'm going to go with the latter. It, it, the criticisms of, of Carson are, are, are racism? No, I don't think racist. they're racism at all. No, are you sure? I don't at all. I think you're probably I racist. Such I'm a not, but I'm... <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you're God, I hate you, I really. <laughs> I think I hate you. No, I think there's legitimate Grant, criticism you're... against him. Of course, I'm just kidding around. Guy can't doesn't understand a joke. This is the problem with Kevin. Anyway, Grant, um, what do you think about Ben Carson? I think you'd probably give him the most scathing review. What do you think? Yeah, um, he has repeatedly come out as anti-gun, uh, and that's huge for me. Uh, I own him a fair amount of firearms. So uh, he, I think he actually came out in support of the assault weapons ban. I don't, I don't quote me on that, but I, that was all some time ago. Uh, I think he really just got caught up in a moment of, um, like you said, the the Obama prayer breakfast thing, where he criticized Obama right in front of him, and then the whole Obamacare debate that followed shortly after that. And of course, he's a doctor, so he can weigh in on all these things. And it, as far as healthcare goes, he did make some really great points. Um, about uh, people paying their own costs and not following this path of a bunch of uh, insurance for everybody because that doesn't work. Um, but I, I, as far as president goes, I wouldn't say he's really conservative and I definitely wouldn't vote for him in the primary. Um, he seems to, again, be pandering to the sort of moderate, kind of getting away from the Liberty Tea Party thing to uh, probably appeal to the more minority vote, to be honest. Uh, I think he would make a great. Uh, I think he would make a great uh, uh, cabinet per, uh, cabinet member. So. Good, that's a good point, Mike. What do you th what do you how do you feel about uh, Dr. Ben Carson? I think I, I I'm mostly in line with Grant, and I think Grant hit upon a really good point, and that's that Ben Carson kind of bursts on the scene because he's a physician and he was able to criticize Obamacare, and people respected that. And I think that's kind of kind of how he bursts onto the scene. But from a constitutional conservative or a libertarian perspective, uh, I think he leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, I, I wouldn't personally vote for Carson. I don't know if he would make a good cabinet member or not. Yeah, I guess it would depend on the situation. But, yeah, I think Grant hits hits most of the main points that I would have said anyway, um, mainly with the health care. That's how he got onto the scene. But what qualifies him other than that uh, to be someone that we would want to vote for? I don't see much there. Okay, I kind of wanted to move on now because everybody's probably tired of hearing about presidential candidates. And I know Grant knows something about this, is uh, 3D printing. Um, huh? We could, I don't know, you know, we could tie this off obviously into intellectual property and so on and so forth, but tell us a little bit about what you know about 3D printing, how this thing works, so, what I can 3D So there's print. a lot of different ways they do 3D printing, but the basic way to explain it, it and as far as an industrial standpoint and even into the home stand, manufacturing goes, is you take a 3D model from SolidWorks or any kind of 3D modeling program, transfer it into a 3D printing program that comes with your hardware, and depending on how much money you spent within a certain amount of time, you'll get a part to within a certain amount of tolerance uh, 
made out of ABS plastic, which is just your standard run-of-the-mill plastic. And um, the more expensive ones use a hard coat structure on the outside. Uh, that is like the one that I work for a high-end manufacturing company, and, and the one we got there is one of the nicer ones that has this hard coat on the outside. Um, but as far as home goes, it's you can get a really nice 3D printer for five thousand dollars easily, and as and that's it's not a lot of money, all things considered. And, and it seeing it at work, uh, I didn't realize how powerful the technology is until now. Uh, it, it's I mean, you're going to have people think about it this way. If you need a wrench, you usually go to Home Depot, right? Why not print it at your own house out of plastic? So what if it lasts you a few weeks and breaks, right? And then imagine that on a much larger scale and how that sort of affects the uh, entire economy. I, I think it's going to be a force to be reckoned with in, in probably the next now. Le maybe less than a year, two years. The price is only going to go down for a 3D printer. Yeah, that's a good. Now that's where and that's where the problem lies. What do you think? And I'm going to start with you, Grant. Give me a brief. Uh, you know, you you would probably know this best, but intellectual property, copyright law. Um, you know, with the 3D printer, I can probably copy. I don't. I don't know. Maybe a necklace, right? A ring. Um, well, here's the thing. You, it, it's only going to be the color of the material, the plastic you make. So if you have like a gold, like if you want to make a gold ring or whatever to wear out one night. For you know, your girlfriend wants to wear a gold ring or not, you can't just 3D print it because it won't look right. Um, now that said, they only can do it now with plastic, and you got to think how much longer until they can do it with metal. And once they start doing it with metal, is yeah, it's only plastic and biomaterials. Like they started experimenting with organs and uh, things like that. But when they can start doing it with metals, which I think probably will happen at some point, then we'll have a serious debate about how that affects like you. See, your IP and, and I mean, well, yeah, they 3D print there, homes now. Like that's incredible. Well, there are thir there are certain things like let's say figurines, um, like you know a Ninja Turtle. Yeah. I know Kev Kevin still plays with Ninja Turtles. He talks to me about them all the time. I'm like, what do I care about Ninja Turtles? But he's just trying. Well, you like he, the My Little Pony, so. No, I'm a br I'm definitely a brony, but that's right. that's really that's out of bounds. That's out of bounds, dude. Um, okay. But you can uh. I mean, you could copy these things like certain plastic things, and I mean, it, I don't know. Probably they won't go after you because of the cost of litigation. But let's say, I'm, can people mass produce things on there? Can they? Can they copy? Well, that's the, that's the current issue is through is throughput. Um, so you can you can print something, and let's say you can print something in two hours, right? But then you have to yeah. take down the printer, pop the part off, boil it in water to get all the excess plastic off of it. Uh, and then you gotta set it up again and run it. So from a throughput standpoint, you probably can't like start mass producing figurines and little tools and stuff through your house, you know. But like a, a friend of mine, he works for the toy company Technics. You remember those things, the little things that click on and a little gear looking. Remember those? Okay, so he works for them and they bought him a 3D printer for his home, and he can make all his parts he needs at home. Uh, okay, so it. Uh, his is, is probably the size of a PC. Oh, that's not bad. And that's a, that's a lower end model. I mean, the one that we have at, at work is like six and a half feet tall. Oh, okay. So that's the size of... It does an 8x8 uh, cube. Okay. All right. Uh, Mike, we got into IP a little bit there. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of libertarians that feel that IP is unnecessary. Um, and then certainly with the advent of 3D printers, and like Grant said, if it, you could start to replicate other materials and manipulate other things, you probably, you may be, you know, um, you may be intruding on other people's private property, things that have been taken out of the commons uh, through IP law and copyright laws and, and trademarks and trade dress and so on and so forth. What do you think? Do you think this is a problem? Do you think IP is legitimate or do you think it's illegitimate? And do you think technology Will I don't know. Do you, do you think technology will render intellectual property useless at some point? Go ahead. No, I don't think technology will render intellectual property a, a moot point. But I do think that it it presents some problems to intellectual property. I think there's a role for intellectual property to play. But w w when it comes to 3D printing, I see it kind of similar to downloading music. You know, it, downloading music is is a violation of intellectual property, but it's very unenforceable. You know, but the difference for me is, can you pass off work as your own? 
It, now, if you're if you take a, a part and you sell it, you mass produce it, and you sell it, and it's someone else's design, yeah, I have a problem with that. But if you're just gonna you know download it at your house like a wrench so that you can use it to fix something, yeah, okay, that's technically a violation of intellectual property, but it's along the same lines as downloading music. It's unenforceable. So I, I don't have as much of a problem with that. Where I would have a problem is if people start mass producing uh, something that someone else invented. That would be where it would become more of a problem. So you, now why would you, what do you, what get, in your view, I'm stuttering here. I see that J Josie's on the chat. I'm getting all flustered. Um, what, <laughs> see, Kevin gets very jealous. Don't be jealous, all right? We have a thing and you know, it's not a real thing. But I like She's to think that daughter. it is. I'm actually. She is my daughter. Oh, that's why you're definitely you're okay. Be honest, you're her grandpa, right? Stop trying to pass her off as your dad. Anyway, Mike, what do you think is a legitimate case for IP? Let's more broadly. Do you think it adds to incentives, or do you think it's an invasion of other people's property rights? Let's say I hold a patent and an idea for I don't know a sprinkler. And then at my place, I have the materials to make a sprinkler, put a sprinkler together, and the government comes along and says, look, you can't have that sprinkler, that was somebody else's idea, and you can't manipulate your private property to do the same thing that, someone, uh, that, that, that belongs to somebody else. Do you think that's necessarily a bad thing? Do you think there's an incentive, stru an incentive structure created by it? Go ahead, let me know, and educate me, enlighten me. Well, I think that... Like I said, I think there's a role for intellectual property to play when it comes to making a profit because I think there is an incentive structure. And I think studies have shown, economic studies have shown, there's an incentive structure that is best, is it is best you, and intellectual property helps that. When it comes to doing something like, like you said, where I'm going to make a sprinkler and maybe it's close to a copy of something that you invented, I don't have a problem with stuff like that. You can do what you want with your property. My problem is if you sell it for a profit. So, you you take right. it you take someone else's property like let's say I wrote a book you know I have a problem if I write a book you write the same exact book and then sell it for a profit that's that's right that's where my problem comes in okay then that's a, and well two different things I, I just want to jump in I just want to jump in really quick so you can actually buy um, this is kind of different three D printing is really easily because all easy because all you have to do is take a model and just drop it in and boom it's done. But right now, you could go and buy a commercial Bridgeport mill or a commercial lathe that you can easily fit on a small workbench in, in your desk somewhere and make just about anything with that. So the the problem is now is what Mike or that problem the the issue at hand now is when people start getting 3D printers, it's going to be a lot easier to make things. You can already do it, and people already do. Uh, like, for example, as a gun owner, I go on the gun websites all the time. And there's plenty of people with like uh, these kind of machine tools in their basement and they're just like, yeah, I made this one part. Well, someone else already makes that uh, and then they might sell it to a friend. So again, is it, that's kind of unenforceable. Like, what are you going to do about it? Right. Uh, yeah, it it's only becomes enforceable when, when the costs, like let's say what, what Mike said, that it becomes beneficial to whoever created it to uh, you know, enact or, or to use the law. Like the, the costs outweigh the, or the benefits outweigh the costs. Kevin, what do you think of intellectual property? I mean, you're heavily state influenced. You're looking to consolidate government power. So I'm assuming that IP law is right up your alley, as well as drinking scotch all day from your plush palatial estate in Kenny Bunkport, Maine, where you and Jeb Bush party together with only the finest. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to take a time out to thank you for skipping me twice now in the question rotation. It allowed me to do some knitting. Did you and twice? I didn't about, skip you, you know, twice. Yeah, you skipped me twice in the question rotation, so I'd really like to give a shout out to you as a little asshole. But second of all, I just want to point out that I, the whole idea... It must be that my hatred is actually subconscious at this point. <laughs> no, you, you skipped me, and then you went in reverse order. So it went back to Grant. So fuck you. Anyways, libertarians <laughs> love the idea of... Sorry, I, didn't, I really didn't mean, <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Okay, okay. I'll be the moderator next week. Um, anyways, libertarians love 3D printers. It, to them, it holds this promise of sort of getting them out of the influence of government. It's the same with Bitcoin. They, they, they think of these technologies as being something that's going to free them from, you know, in the case of Bitcoin, uh, the government monopoly on currency. 
versus, you know, with 3D printers, the government monopoly on uh, intellectual property, or at least their, their right to, to, um, to enforce intellectual property, as well as um, the reason that um, they love, for example, guns. There's certain regulations, uh, gun regulations, that they think that they can actually get past using uh, a 3D printer. And um, <laughs> I'd like to point out that if somebody prints a 3D gun and everybody's all happy about it, no, they didn't just print the 3D gun. They printed a model. Okay, isn't that right, people in the side there? Yes, that's, comment? I, I just that's right. Somebody's comment. So, anyways, um, that's the whole point: is that people believe that they can bypass regulations, that they can bypass intellectual property using 3, 3D printing. I don't know if realistically that's the case right now. As Grant said earlier, it's mostly plastic. I do think I've heard of a, a metal a, a 3D printer. And I know that there's some uh, biomaterial 3D printing going on right now. I think the promise is really what's, what's more important than the um, reality right now. Um, and then again, the last point I'll make is if it does start to threaten intellectual property, what's to, hap what's to stop the government from doing the same thing they did to Napster and, and to come in and shut it down and, and to, to Pirate Bay or, or some other organizations that they've harassed? What's to stop them from say, I mean, people can grow marijuana in their house what's to stop them from from raiding a, a house or or something to, to go after your 3d printers i mean it right. sounds far-fetched right now well, again but it's happened in other realms it's not so much the government that necessarily enforces it it's the person who ha holds the patent they would decide whether or not that they would want to uh you know use you know would want to the government to enforce that patent and again it would come down to costs like let's say if i i don't know i could copy this whole book right here David Friedman's book, you know what I mean? I could copy it in my house, but no one's going to come after me because the cost would far outweigh the benefits of him copying it. But if I copied the book and disseminated it as my own and probably made a profit or cut into his market, he would probably come after me at that point. Again, I don't think anybody's really going to care if you, you know, if you copy certain things in your own home or certain things. Sometimes even the mold may be patented. So maybe, perhaps maybe the mold of the gun is patented. I don't know. But I'm just saying that they won't come after you for little things like that. I mean, teachers do it all the time. They copy chapters of book to put them chapters of books to put them online. So again, it comes down to a cost benefit scenario. What did you What did you want to add, Mike? Well, I think you know Kevin brings up the point that you know the government came after Napster. Napster was just a platform for downloading music. In right. order to go after 3D printers, you would have to go after every single individual that has a 3D printer. Right. And you can take down one site that maybe has certain files on it that you don't want people to download, but then other people are just going to share those files on a different website. So you'd have to go after every individual. You know, when Napster went down, BearShare cropped up. When BearShare went down, you know, I don't remember all right. these. But, I mean, it's not hard to download music. But I think the, the better point that you made, Kevin, was that it's more about the statement that it makes. You can't print an entire gun, a 3D gun, but the political point that it makes, and I think one of the more interesting things is they printed out a, a fully functional, you know, 30 round magazine. Okay, well, if you, if we can print out a magazine, this renders your laws completely useless because whether or not we can print out a full gun, you can legislate the magazine. We're just going to print one out, and you take down the website that we're going that we're that we're putting it on. We're just going to put it up somewhere else, and once. 400 people download it, they can see it to other people. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, can you print a whole gun? No, but you can make a really big political statement with 3D printing. Okay. I like your thoughts. You can print you can print a, you can print AR15 lower receivers, but they won't last more than about 50 rounds. And that's just because of the material issue, not because of the printing itself. And that, uh, but again, that's, I mean, who knows how that's going to change in the next three to three years, five years. God only knows what will happen. Okay. Interesting. This 3D printing and IP law. Um, what else can we go into? Can we ask Kevin why his living room is so well put together and he has two, what do they call those kinds of doors that open, you know, probably outward to a giant pool? What is it like being part of the 0.01%, Kevin? <laughs> it's awesome. I wake up every day and think, should I donate money to, to Will? And I always say no, the same thing every day. <laughs> I know I can help you I out. I just want to I let everybody in. You through college. I, I could probably be your break in life, Will, but I decide not to every day. 
French doors. They're French doors. You have French, French doors. doors. I mean, you want to talk about aristocracy here, for God's sake. Wait, wait, wait. Look I have at a you. pillar. Look at Grant coming. He's got a, a little pillar. cubicle. Look that. Yeah, look, he's got a pillar. Yeah. And French doors. I mean, God. I mean, thank you for paying most a majority of the federal income taxes. You probably get around it some way. I don't know how you yeah, do it, do. but Offshore. you probably do. Offshore. Look at Mike. Look at me. Cayman Islands. Look at where poor Grant and Mike. They got these little, these little, you know, very uh, economical little. My walls are paper thin, thin, man. Yeah, you see, and then there you are. My neighbor's house is attached to me. What the hell is that? <laughs> this guy's got French doors. He's got French doors that open up into about thirty acres. And a large uh, Olympic-sized swimming pool. I've been there one time. It was weird. He invited me over and tried to give me this happy juice. He called it. It was in a Pepsi can. I would never go to Kevin's house. I would never go to yeah. Kevin's house. Like, oh, have That's a place you never leave. Right. The other guy drank it, and he was falling asleep on his couch, like on his stomach. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> um, what else did we say we wanted to talk about today, other than Kevin's? Uh, Michael Jackson like tendencies. You're doing this is a horrible moderating job. You ran out of topics. There's why don't you start? Well, I was studying. I was a last questions. minute addition. I didn't. I didn't prep. Oh yeah, let's do some questions. They're very good. Thank you, Kevin. Thank You're you welcome. for getting me in line here. I hate you. Oh, I got to take Francis McCluskey because this guy is legendary. This guy is. <laughs> let's see. He is a legend. Let's see, Francis McCluskey. I got it. McCloskey, or however you want to say it. President Obama is not on the far left or even on the far left at all. He is a centrist. Also, yes, it is possible to be too far to the right. There's no honor in being a tyrant. I don't know what any of that means. Mike, can you give me a fan <laughs> and try to, like, can you try to put that into, like, some sort of a coherent sentence? There's a lot of exclamation points. Do you think Obama's a centrist? First of all, I think Obama might be close. I think Obama might be too close to too far to the right and a tyrant. So, yeah, so Frank, he's definitely uh, Frank. Yeah. Well, okay. Let's let's think about some of the things that Obama's done. All right. O Obama was. Obama had a lot of great things to say back in 2007, but he didn't follow through on any of them. Obama's a complete tyrant. Mm -hmm. He he talked about you know, hey, let me restore habeas corpus. Never mind. I'm not going to do that. Yeah, I'm going to repeal the Patriot Act. Never mind. I'm not going to do that. Hey, I'm going to stop bombing countries. Now I'm going to drone bomb every, <laughs> everybody in the world. So, uh, you know, if we want to talk about tyrants and being too far to the right, maybe we should talk about Barack Obama because I don't see much difference between him and George W. Bush. Good points. Good points, Michael. Boom, Francis. In your girly name. Guantanamo Bay is still open. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you think, Kevin? Do you think um, Francis has a I point here? Dead. I think the next person after the next liberal after Obama is going to be Warren. And then I think you're really going to see somebody too far to the left. I think you're going to see somebody who's got some ideas that are economically, at least, are insane. I don't mean to use that word when talking to Francis McCloskey. And totalitarian. Elizabeth, yes. Let's be honest, Elizabeth the left Warren. is fairly totalitarian. Yes. Elizabeth Warren, Francis, is your candidate. I mean, she's... She wants all the same things you do. She wants the tw a twenty-five dollar minimum wage. If it had kept up with, pro if it had kept up with productivity, was that her her argument that it would be twenty-five dollars right now, something like that? That is your line of thinking, Francis. That puts the in in insane right there. So, I, if that's who I'd be looking for, if I was you, Frank. All right, let's end with his question. That thing was ridiculous, and I want to start with Grant on this question. Um, can you see that Grant up there? Yeah, why do you think libertarians have such a hard time with the idea of voting for Rand? Don't let perfect be the enemy of good is how the saying goes, and that's exactly what I see going on right now. The system as it is right now makes it near impossible for a pure libertarian candidate to win, so the best choice would be to support Rand, and then it stops, I guess, such a character movement, uh, as a step towards that goal. So, uh, I... I uh, <laughs> I think they have a hard time voting for him, and rightfully so, because every single person that stepped on the podium and has said, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, never does. And they've done that for the last, I mean, since World War II, maybe. And every political promise I, that I can think of since World War II has been a complete failure. I mean, the, the biggest, the 
biggest monstrosities of pol of policy making have been well intended to help other people and as the saying goes the alibi of tyrants is all is always the welfare of the people uh and, and obama case in point uh but I, I think libertarians have a hard time voting for them one because they don't like voting because it's violating the non-aggression principle uh and two because they just see him as another politician in a suit which is kind of ironic considering how many of them how many libertarians love ron paul i love ron paul uh, uh but i see Rand paul as a, an outreach to libertarians who are tired of the gop neocons um, not as someone trying to cater to the libertarian extreme and i think the libertarian extreme brace yourself for the comments the libertarian extreme is not that big of a voting base He's definitely on the outside looking in. Kevin, what do you think about this question? You, you would know. You would you, you would give a good answer on this, I think. I don't think. Well, you don't do anything well, so I take that back. But what do you think about this? Libertarians have a hard time voting for anybody, like like you said, Grant, because they don't vote. But also because they are such a fragmented group. I mean, you have, you know the, the the libertarian model or whatever is a snowflake. They're all individuals. Every libertarian wants to vote for themselves. They don't want to vote for anybody who has the slightest variation from their own beliefs. And that, so they don't vote. They don't want to vote for anybody who has the, even the slightest difference in their own uh, beliefs. That's what I've found in, in the libertarian community. Unbiased America, most of the fans are libertarians, and I fight with them all the time because they don't want to vote, and they don't want, they don't want to support any politician. So whatever <clears throat> tiny minority of people I, I self-identify as libertarian, they're not going to be much of a help to Rand Paul. It's just not going to happen. They're not going to push him over the top. He's going to need to, to go to the, the voting base. He's going to need to reach out to conservatives, and you're seeing him do that. And in some ways, he's hiding some of his libertarian um, agenda from them just to get yeah, elected. Here. And I think that's probably what we're going to see more of. That, does, that doesn't look like a heart, does it? No. Sorry. No. It definitely looks like a funny face. Like, looks like an ass from behind. <laughs> it does. Yeah. That's pretty funny. All right. Shut up, Kevin. All right. Um, let's get to Michael's question. I wanted to get to Mike on this one, actually. Bo Bergdahl, that's what came out in the news today. And Bo Bergdahl is actually being charged with desertion. Michael, as a former member of the Army, what's your take on this? Do you think he was a deserter? Um, or do you think his unit's just trying to sell him out? Well, his unit's not trying to sell him out. It's weird that there's a mixed opinion on this. This guy literally let, walked off his post. And when he did this, look, it, it set back operations in Afghanistan for three straight days. You know, people died looking for this guy. People went out, there were search parties. They died looking for this guy. And now five years later, he's captive from Taliban on his own, at his own accord, by the way. And, uh, you know, we, we end up exchanging uh, prisoners of war for him. Uh, and, I, you know, the people, I think this was a political ploy by Obama. He, he wanted to, sh to show that he could, that he was, you know, bringing back a POW. Well, you brought back the wrong guy. This guy walked off base. He was a deserter. It's about time they finally charge him. And it's, what's weird to me is how long it took because everybody knew that he was a deserter. Everybody knew he walked off the post on his own accord, and and it took what six to nine months to charge him with this crime. I have no problem with him charging with it now. He needs to be punished for it. It was absolutely ridiculous. Okay, I agree with that. I mean, I could clearly a deserter. Um, Kevin, do you have anything? Kevin, do you have anything to add to this? Do you even watch the news? I mean, I know that you probably have an eighty-inch platinum plasma LCD high retina television that no one none of us can afford um do you watch the news on it ever i hear the news two days before you do will i know uh, i, know I knew it they just two days. yeah one percent maybe one percent no i think bergdahl's i think what bergdahl is should be frankly is a huge um a huge scandal and he's not gonna be because uh well for a lot of reasons but mostly because the, the media's is is keeping it from being a scandal but he was he was traded for five very dangerous taliban uh prisoners from guantanamo and it was at the time 
remember what's her name susan rice was saying that that bergdahl is a hero and that he was he did his his he he served his uh he served the military in his country well and they had a big ceremony at the the white house where they you know he stood with his parents and with the president the whole thing was bs and uh you know now it's become plain to see that he was given up i mean he was traded for five very dangerous people three of which it came out in the news today are now back working for the taliban um in some capacity bad trade yeah bad trade this is babe ruth all over again yeah, I remember when the when uh, the, the House Republicans, House and Senate Republicans, criticized them for this. The the Democrats attacked them as if they're somehow like anti-American. That we don't leave a we don't leave anybody behind. Do, do you remember that? Yep. Grant, go ahead. Was wasn't there a wasn't uh, what's that guy's name? The Sergeant T Tamarusi? Is that how you say his name? Tamarusi. The the guy who was in Mexican. Mexican yeah. jail at the same time they were doing the Bergdahl trade. It's like you're, you're going to leave the guy in jail and like, go train the deserter for five terrorists. Right. Right. So it, it right. was guy, if, if, even if it was a political move, it was a very poorly thought out, horribly thought out move. I mean, he had this guy in Mexican jail who he could have just made one phone call and he'd be free to go, and Republicans would have loved that. But um, I, I don't even know what the hell he was thinking. I, it really baffles me. It was one of the things Obama, one of many things Obama has done that I, I can't explain his yeah, logic behind yeah, it. Trying to, I mean, that, that trying is kind of Guantanamo, and that was one of to him it was a win-win because he gets three more people out of Guant or five more people out of Guantanamo. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Well, I think I, mean, I think Kevin I think Kevin's right. right too that that uh the media is going to ignore this, and I think it's. I think it's it's a shame because this yeah it's a huge deal it's a huge it was a huge deal at the time you know no one really wanted to talk about it it's been known in the military community since it happened that he was a deserter you know it wasn't any a secret and you you can't convict him in the court of public opinion or in the court of military opinion obviously but people knew you know that this was a problem but the media told the story and told the narrative that Obama wanted them to tell they never brought up yeah. anything about you know the desertion and you have you have people that were in his unit screaming about this you, they didn't even bring it up you at least had to bring it up and now six months later you know now they're finally charging them but yeah it should be a bigger scandal than it is you let go of terrorists to get them you never brought it up to begin with you didn't even listen to people in his own unit it, it's just it's to me it's just mind blowing that the story was never reported in a fair way yeah and this goes to this goes to the broader problem with Obama negotiating anything and negotiating the Iranian deal now and his foreign his just stance on foreign policy is very sophomoric. It's like it's very inchoate. He he doesn't see he has he's just a very bad leader. Um, and that can we just need a we need a new guy like a Rand Paul or a Ted Cruz. These guys that lead they stand on principle and both of them do. And that principle I think is the Constitution, which I can get into that all day. But Grant, I want to go to this next question. Um, what do you think of 3D printed jet engines? Do you think that could ever happen? I don't know. I didn't click on the Guardian link. Well, okay, so so we've we the company I work for we've machined jet engine parts, um, various types, sizes, tolerances, difficulties. As far as 3D printing them, I don't know if that actually works. I'm not an engineer. Uh, more on the management side of the business, but. I don't see how that could ever, ever work because it's for the one reason that it's plastic and you're talking about a jet engine and regardless of where a part is on a jet engine, it's going to be exposed to heat and obviously heat melts plastic. Uh, so I've never heard of that happening before. I might be wrong. If whoever asked that question could Grant. put a source in the comments, I would love to see that. That would be very interesting to read about. Um, but I have heard of people starting to 3D print um, homes, and I think that will be the biggest, uh, the well, the most immediate impact on uh, on uh, the economy. Three D printing homes. I mean, be, Mike, being liberal, we're, we're crazy about it. They said we could solve the world's homeless problem by three D printing everybody a home. <laughs> yeah. Because the resources to make that don't cost anything, but you said he. Yeah, right. Because right? plastic is free. It's not like there's a <laughs> lack of, of resources. Yeah, um, Grant, you said that heat melts plastic. I just want a follow-up question: Does jet fuel melt steel beams? Oof. 
I don't know. It depends, it depends on uh, what libertarian or anarchist you asked. Uh, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, uh, but uh, does jet fuel melt steel beams? I don't know. Let's see what the comments guys have to say. I'm gonna go with no. You're gonna go with no. <laughs> just okay. to stir, just to, just to stir the pot though. Just to stir the pot. Michael, can jet fuel mixed with steel beams? Uh, I read. I read. The, I read the entire Popular Mechanics article. You did? Mixed with steel beams? That. What does that even mean? Well, I don't know. Let's say can yeah, jet, jet fuel mixed with steel can beams. Talking, Will. Can, can jet fuel melt steel beams? That's the that's the question here. And can jet fuel Look, melting I read, steel I read, beams I've read different uh, articles and different studies about this. I read the Popular Mechanics article. Yeah, I think it can. You can. Okay, it can. It My doesn't have to. to Kevin it softens is, it. All it does is it softens. It it takes away some of the durability of it to the point where it collapses. You people are morons. And I know this is just some <laughs> that's been going around. But God damn it! If I hear this one more fucking time. Well, yeah. After the uh, after the plane crash in well, the plane crash just happened in Europe. I saw a meme where a plane crashes in Europe and, and, and debris goes everywhere, but a plane crashes in the Pentagon and no one can find debris anywhere. It's like, God, all right, guys, come on. <laughs> hey, we should do a show on the conspiracy theory stuff. I guarantee you that would be a Oh, show. that would be great. Yeah. Will plus Josie yeah, plus Yeah, get Kevin. jealous, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> what? I have a chalkboard. I might as well use it. Shut up. Um, guys, one more question, guys. I'll ideas. take one more, and it's not going to be Francis McCluskey. Oh, McCluskey left. It's time for American Idol. So, um, <laughs> here's one. Oh no, we answered Ben Carson. I don't want to get into that one. Oh, I'll have to take a. I'll have to take a McCluskey one. Here's a good question. Cruz is very anti-gay and very anti-poor. He does not deserve to be this country's president. And Rand Paul doesn't either. Exclamation. Ben Carson also doesn't deserve to be the president. He hates gay people, too. <laughs> Our next president should be Hillary Clinton, Elizabeth Warren, or Bernie Sanders. Now, I'm going to pull a question out of this. And I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna pose it to all three of you guys. Who do you think would destroy the country more? Hillary Clinton, Elizabeth Warren, or Bernie Sanders? Mike, you go first. I, I think... You know, to be honest, I think Bernie Sanders would, and here's the reason why. <laughs> I, I think Elizabeth Warren. I don't. I don't think she's actually sincere. I think that she plays this this role, she so that she can kind of conjure up some excitement and some votes. But I don't think she's actually sincere. I think Bernie Sanders is completely sincere in all of his economic opinions and everything he says. I think he's a totally sincere guy. Which to me, if he was ever elected president. I don't think that he would be someone that would cave to special interests, which is unfortunate for him because I think that he would actually try to implement a lot of the ideas he espouses, which would be extremely dangerous. So, yeah, I think Bernie Sanders could do a ton of damage only because more than Hillary and Elizabeth Warren because I believe he's absolutely sincere in his stupid opinions. Okay. <laughs> Grant, same question. Grant, same question. All right, so let me just start off by saying one of the things that really annoys me about the liberal left is that they completely continue to go on about how they're anti-corporatist, but then they support people like Elizabeth Warren and Hillary Clinton. It's like, okay, guys, uh, so let's, let's take a step back here. I have to have a go with um, Hillary Clinton, and it's a close one but with Elizabeth Warren because of how just uh, – I did a post at uh, We Are Capitalists about her, and she is just really out there. Um, but Hillary Clinton, on the other hand, is just in the Wall Street pocket. I mean, she's a Keynesian by birth. Uh, uh, she's a hawk. Look what she did to Libya. And, and I'm only picking Hillary Clinton because I can actually prove how ridiculously insane she is. Uh, and then she had a speech the other day where she said she wants to put adults in fun camps. Uh, that one kind of threw me for a loop. I was really sure what she's going at. That's funny because when I go to Kevin's, he always calls it fun camp. He's like, Will, come to my fun cam and drink some of my fun juice. And I'm like, she I said we have a uh, fun deficit. What are, her, what are her words? We have a fun deficit in America, so adults need to go to fun camp. 
Um, so it's, I think Hillary Clinton, but only on the grounds that she has a proven historical track record as Secretary of State and as a senator of being just a tyrant and, and authoritarian. Uh, and, and Elizabeth Warren, she just talks crazy. Uh, if she really is that crazy, she probably is, but I'm going to go with Hillary. Okay, Kevin, I'm actually, well, I have, have a new three, question three, for you. Oh, a new question, all right. I have a, well, it's, it's kind of an offshoot of this one. Did you get the term fun juice and fun camp from Elizabeth Warren, or did she, Elizabeth Warren get those terms from you? That's my IP. And you did have fun here, by the way, so shut the fuck up. You don't remember having fun. I don't remember. Me, the pictures, I don't the remember pictures if I had show fun. That you had fun, okay? It's the best kind of fun. <laughs> I left in a wheelchair. No, I'm going to answer that the question I because I think we have three different, I think, we, we, I, I'm going to vote for Warren because I think she, I think there's a lot of people on the left who actually believe her, her, her shit, her tripe. She comes up with some, some economic, people think that she's like this economic genius. When if you know anything about economics, the things she says are so wrong that it's frustrating. And Will, you and I have talked about this. Some of her theories, some of the things she comes up with, a lot of the people on the left, like, oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's wrong. It's all the things that she says. People believe her, and she's completely fucking nuts. And if she becomes president, people are really gonna put people are gonna take her words as expert opinion, and they're not. They're from a fucking idiot. Uh, well, I don't mean to say that. I don't. I don't mean to sound like a, I'm racist against Indians or anything, but you know, she definitely is. A <laughs> Well, you're clearly anti-Native American, so, um, you know, I was questioning that. I was we knew this already, that now You're, you're anti-Native American. Yeah, it's very confirmed at this point. But um, we kind of went mm -hmm. over here because it's a great show. Um, I want to remind you guys, um, hold on a second. I got an email. I have to, but I want to remind you guys to follow Unbiased America. Um, I don't want you to listen to anything that Kevin ever says, ever. But he ran a great page, built it up from nothing, mostly with my help, probably, but not really. Um, I also want you to follow Grant's page, and I, I don't, I don't want to screw this up, but I want to say a lib it's a libertarian mind. No, 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 no. Uh, the modern libertarian. The God modern damn libertarian. it, Kevin. I or can't God, do God it. damn it, Will. <laughs> no I can't do it. You both look the same. You're the same hair. What do you, what do you want from me? The fuck is modern libertarian coming from? Kevin, did you? <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold on a second, Michael. I think he did use just for men. Do you have a red tint in your hair? He I copied my haircut yes, and he trying to almost trying to copy my. He does haircut. have a red tint. This is incredible. All right, I, I'm moving along now. I mean, you're just really you're trying to become me. All right, Michael. I want you to follow Being Liberal Logic. Michael's a great page. He also does really great websites. He's also on Being Classically Liberal, where he comes out with some excellent content. Michael's a great writer. Um, other than that, he struggles, mainly in social situations where his ineptitude shines through. Um, yeah. Also, I want you guys to uh, know that on Spreecast tonight, you can uh, watch Eye on the Empire, a foreign policy show that starts at 9 p.m. Eastern which I think is well past Kevin's bedtime. Um, I'm pretty sure, isn't that right? Doesn't your wife make you go to bed pre-9 p.m. because you get something about you That's being right. cranky? I have to get okay. my 16-year-old libertarian wife to bed. Oh, yeah, now you're... <laughs> Digestive <laughs> problems, too. Somebody just has the perfect life over there in Kenny Bunkport, huh? <laughs> um, Jeffrey Tucker's going to be on. Scott Horton's going to be on. It'll be a good show. Again... I want to thank We Are Capitalists, Grant from We Are Capitalists, and Jason from We Are Capitalists. Um, it's a great page. Follow it. And, of course, the analytical conservative, which is the best ever, empirically proven to be the best of all time. <laughs> well, so, I want to thank all two of your again. followers. Yeah, and I want to thank <laughs> all two. I want to thank all three of the people that my posts that are, our posts reach every week. And um, thanks for tuning in. And uh, I will... I'll talk to you soon. No, I'm not from Boston. I'm from New York. I'm from New York, for God's sake. All right. Pepper grinder. Pepper grinder. All right, everybody. Thanks for thanks for coming on. <laughs> See you guys. Bye.